Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the Director of the Energy and National Security Program at CSIS, and thank you all very much for turning out today uh, for the release of our new report. If you haven't gotten a copy, they're out there uh, on the uh, back uh, table, uh, and we've got them online as well, in addition to uh, some compendiums of other studies and some data tables for those of you who uh, don't find the detail in here to be enough. I want to dig into a little bit more. Um, today is the uh, is the official rollout of our uh, our new report called uh, Remaking American Power, uh, which is uh, the sort of uh, our attempt at looking at sort of the broader economic or energy sector impacts uh, of the clean power plan. Uh, for those of you who joined us in June, we did a preliminary rollout uh, of some of our initial findings. Um, today's session will build on some of what we presented uh, in that session uh, and then also uh, focus a little bit on having a conversation about what it means uh, for, for different participants within, uh, within the sort of CPP implementation uh, and sort of actualization process. One of our real main goals in doing this report uh, was to uh, help folks, uh, a broad set of stakeholders, you know, the folks who produce uh, uh, electricity, the folks who produce oil and natural gas and coal, the folks who are uh, thinking about how to create this rule, uh, uh, finalize this rule, implement this rule, come up with their own strategies for sort of the design options and elements, um, to think about not only sort of the downstream impacts um, by that, you know, uh, uh, capacity additions or retirements, fuel mix, uh, cost of electricity bills, things like that to consumers, um, uh, ultimate emissions reduction potential, um, but also some of the broader energy sector impacts, uh, the things that happen uh, in terms of, you know, natural gas or coal production, uh, revenue uh, generated by that, and sort of ultimately, you know, receipts. Uh, received uh, for that, both at sort of the regional and national level. And we thought it was an important uh, perspective to put on the table at this time when people are considering all of the ways in which they can engage uh, in the, the discussion over the rule uh, and their own approach to uh, figuring out their implementation choices. Uh, I wanted to just take a second to thank the co-authors and our partner on uh, on the report, the Rhodium Group. Um, this was a, a really fun, and I, seriously, uh, fun uh, endeavor, endeavor. Uh, working with uh, Trevor and John and Whitney and uh, Shashank, uh, primarily me and my colleague Michelle Melton, uh, in putting this report together. It really sort of married uh, together the sort of policy market technology focus here that we've got at CSIS in the energy program uh, and the similar sort of focus with the economic and analytical chops that the Rhodium Group brings to the table. So we're very, very pleased uh, to have undertaken this effort and hope uh, that you all find it to be uh, useful. Uh, so what we're going to do today uh, is talk a little bit about uh, uh, what the report says. I'm going to go uh, just to the next slide really quickly. Um, and one of the uh, and then have a little bit of a discussion with some of our guests who are here uh, to talk about what the implications uh, of it are. One of the things we won't go into is some of the detail that we did present uh, in the preliminary findings and you will find in the report about some things that we think are actually pretty, uh, pretty important. Uh, so for example, we talked a lot at the preliminary uh, findings uh, event about some of the, the ways in which we framed the study, which John will talk about in just a moment, um, both in terms of uh, uh, of, of different sort of compliance options, right? How you count energy efficiency, whether it's credited or non-credited, uh, and how you sort of implement that as part of the rule. Um, what level of cooperation uh, you undertake? All of this has real and significant impacts uh, on uh, on the uh, ultimate uh, uh, effect uh, of the rule, both at a regional and, and a national level. There's a lot more detail about that uh, in the study that we didn't uh, that we didn't talk about. And then, um, just to sort of flag it at the outset, we know that there's also uh, a great deal of focus about. Um, a number of, uh, of other elements uh, around sort of C CPP implementation uh, in the broader energy sector impacts. For example, we'll be holding, uh, this is the cheap plug, so 
pay attention. Uh, we'll be holding an event here on December 8th uh, looking at sort of the role of methane in uh, sort of the natural gas value chain. It is not something we took into consideration uh, in this report because it isn't part of, uh, of what we were talking about. We understand that it is a very important part of the ongoing dialogue about the role uh, of, uh, of natural gas uh, in not only sort of the U.S. electric power sector, but also uh, sort of internationally. Um, we also didn't take into consideration you know, some of the things that happen in a post-2030 timeframe, though we do sort of, you know, mark those issues as being important elements of, uh, of the debate that is out there sort of surrounding uh, this rule. Um, so, uh, so we will focus on a few of the things that we thought were particularly significant that we did want to highlight from the report today. Uh, and John and Trevor uh, will go through sort of the impacts and the importance of the broader uh, upstream uh, energy market impacts and how they, in many cases, sort of outweigh uh, some of the downstream impacts. And uh, I think Trevor's going to talk a little bit about that. And then, uh, and then John is going to go through something that we lacked in the last time uh, that we were going, uh, we did sort of the preliminary outreach, which, uh, which was um, uh, sort of a focus on what this means for various regions sort of in comparison. We won't go through all of that information, but we'll do it in an illustrative way to sort of uh, highlight some of the, the key findings that we wanted to bring out today. Um, one last point for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to Trevor to, uh, to uh, go through uh, the first part uh, of the presentation, uh, is that we've got uh, with us uh, two excellent uh, folks working uh, in this space as well to talk through some of the perspectives um, that they bring to the table. Uh, Kate Zyla, who's the Deputy Director of the Georgetown Climate Center, do lots and lots of work uh, on the options that states have in terms of their implementation plan. And so she'll comment on the study from that perspective. Uh, and then we're also very lucky to have Erica Bowman uh, from America's Natural Gas Alliance uh, here to talk about the perspective of the, uh, uh, the oil and gas industry and people who are thinking explicitly about sort of the production side and then down downstream through uh, uh, the sort of distribution side of what this uh, rule could mean uh, and how they're viewing this. Uh, Rick Duke, uh, the Deputy Director of the White House Office on uh, Energy and Climate Change, uh, will also be joining us. He will get here a little bit late, though, however, and uh, he'll give some administration perspective uh, views uh, as well on sort of the work that we've done and, and sort of the perspective they bring to the table. So a lot on the table for a short period of time. Uh, we're very grateful uh, for all of you, you to have joined us. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Trevor to get the, get the ball rolling. So. Okay, well, let me just make a quick uh, Yes. Uh, we'll start walking through some of the results. So it was a pleasure to, as Sarah said, to uh, partner with CSIS on this project uh, and to take advantage of uh, CSIS's uh, unrivaled energy policy and market uh, expertise to tr try to provide a more holistic look at the potential impact of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, most of the focus to date has been on the impact within the electric power sector specifically, but changes within the electric power sector have far-reaching implications for energy markets more broadly, whether it's natural gas production and consumption, coal production and consumption, international energy trade flows. And so that's the kind of bit of the conversation that we're looking to fill in here so that as stakeholders think about how to engage in this process, they have the full picture in front of them of how they're various equities are uh, are impacted. So uh, my colleague John, who uh, uh, who uh, led this effort from our side, is going to start walking through the results. And I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, Whitney Ketchum, who's here with us today, and Shashank Mahan, who's uh, not, who uh, were the real brains behind the operation on, uh, on the uh, rhodium side. Thanks, Trevor. And I'll second that last point. Thank uh, Whitney and Shashank were integral to the to this analysis. And thanks very much. Uh, so. Very quickly, I'm just going to kick off with giving you all a very quick description of what we actually did uh, as far as the analytical approach we took, and then I'll turn it over to Trevor to start talking about the upstream energy and uh, market impacts that we talked about. So there's a lot more in the report, so please refer to that for all the, the nitty-gritty details. But on, on our analytical approach, as both Trevor and Sarah said, you know, the big goal for us is looking not just at the electric power sector, but the broader energy system impacts of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, between our respective teams, we did a deep dive on the actual proposal, got to know it, characterized it in uh, uh, an energy system model called NEMS. It's the same model that EIA uses. We use uh, our own rhodium version of it. Uh, NEMS is actually really useful for this type of energy market analysis because it, also, it not only has a fairly detailed electric power system model, but it also has fairly robust uh, descriptions of upstream oil and gas and coal reserves, renewable energy, and downstream energy demand. So you can actually impose a clean power plan 
uh, policy in the power sector and the interactive effects across the economy can be captured in a model like NEB. So uh, we use that uh, as our main platform for analysis, and uh, out of it we get the national and regional results that are captured in the report you all have in your hand. Uh, to capture the clean power plan itself, it's, I think everybody, now, now that we're a few months out from the proposal, everybody can agree it's pretty complicated. Uh, it's a, there's a lot under the hood in the clean power plan proposal. And I think from the analysis that's done today, you can see there's a lot of different ways to capture the, the, the proposal in, in a modeling effort. Uh, we uh, try to stay at a high level and understand just a couple of key design elements and their impact on broader energy markets. So we are, we were fairly narrow in our uh, drive here. And uh, just for, for background, we started with our, our reference case, which is key to the Annual Energy Outlook 2014, with one small tweak where we include EPA's new source performance standards for, for fossil fuel fired power plants, which, which means almost nothing in the forecast, but it is important that it's in there. Uh, and then for policy scenarios, we tried to stay as close to the original clean power plan emission rate goals as possible. We're trying not to presuppose what states might do, but instead say, okay, what's the least cost way to meet the emission rate goals that EPA has assigned? So that means we've captured uh, uh, the, the policy as a tradable performance standard, uh, either at the national level or regional level. I'll tell you what that means a little bit more in a second. But in a tradable performance standard, if you've got, say, an emission rate goal of 1,000 pounds per megawatt hour, if I'm a more carbon-intensive generator with a higher emission rate, I have a compliance obligation. I have to go out and buy credits so that I can continue to run. That adds to my cost of operation. If I'm a generator below the emission rate level, say a wind generator, I get to generate credits, which is a subsidy for me to run. And so those shifts in incentives change the overall emission rate of, of the regulated fleet, and that's how you eventually get to your emission rate goals set by EPA. There's a number of other ways uh, states can choose to get there uh, from an instrument perspective, uh, such as a mass-based trading program. Uh, they could do uh, what we call in the report a portfolio approach, where you've got a mixture of energy policies that ultimately get your power sector to the emission rate goals. Uh, but we, we decided to keep things um, as it's not quite simple, but it's uh, <laughs> uh, as straightforward as possible with regard to the EPA proposal. Um, and then we, tw we tr changed two variables in the analysis. We changed the level of cooperation, and we changed whether or not states use energy efficiency as part of their, uh, uh, and credit that towards compliance with the emission rate goals. So and we, we chose these in, in large part because we, we had a sense that they would be important for energy market implications. So we have four policy scenarios up on this table. You've got, uh, with regards to energy efficiency crediting, you've got all states uh, either crediting energy efficiency, and, we, and what we mean by that is it's deploying energy efficiency to the level that EPA contemplated in the, uh, in the clean power plan building blocks, or no states use EE uh, crediting as part of their uh, state plans. And then uh, the other variable, the cooperation, we either have a single national tradable performance standard, which is kind of the gold standard for cooperation that would definitely uh, be a, a, a big undertaking under the Clean Power Plan, or you have a regional uh, fragmentation approach where we use the electric market regions in NEMS, and each individual region has to meet its own emission rate goal on its own. Uh, and then because we're interested in energy market impacts, we also tested our uh, analysis against different sensitivity scenarios around different natural gas futures. So we used um, a low oil and gas resource and a high oil and gas resource case to get a sense of how the overall pricing and availability of natural gas might influence compliance pathways, and also a high LNG exports case, which is effectively the same as a high gas demand case, where you see uh, the parameters up there of a 9 BCF a day by 2020 and 18 BCF a day by 2030 export regime. Uh, and so we'll, we'll touch base on a little bit of those results, uh, but if you want more detail on that, I definitely encourage you to look at the report. And speaking of the report, you see on the PowerPoint here, which will also be available afterwards, you, there's a link directly to, uh, to the CSIS website where you can get it. Uh, Sarah mentioned July and our preliminary uh, release. Uh, we uh, got that out there to start the conversation on this, and we're picking it up again here with the final report. And this chart just kind of gives you a sense of what, what we, we covered, covered then and compared to what we're covering now. And the short, the short answer is we're covering everything we covered then, only more so now in the full report. Uh, the presentation's a little more bridge. But we have our full set of 
policy scenarios. We now have our market sensitivities, which we did not cover last time. We have a more uh, uh, complete set of results on the energy and uh, electric power system impacts. And as Sarah noted, we have a much more uh, rich detail on the, on the regional level beyond just the national impacts. So then I'm going to turn it over to Trevor to talk a little bit about what we saw in the uh, energy system. Sure. So as John said, our uh, goal was not to forecast how states will actually comply with the Clean Power Plan, but to look at if states were to take a least cost pathway to compliance, what would that mean for energy markets uh, with those two design uh, variables, so level of cooperation and to extent to which energy efficiency uh, is credited. And the kind of backdrop for the implementation of the Clean Power Plan is a power sector that has undergone some fairly significant changes over the past few years as a result of uh, the shale revolution. Uh, so thanks to relatively low cost natural gas, the share of power generation uh, that comes from natural gas has grown from low 20% up to a high of 33% in 2012. Uh, and is back in the kind of uh, high 20s, low 30s, uh, now in a commensurate decline in coal-fired power generation. If you look at the outlook pre-clean power plan, and this is the 2014 annual energy, energy outlook, outlook from the EIA, generation, U.S. power generation by source, the extent to which coal generation is projected to decline simply as a result of uh, cheap natural gas, uh, we've largely seen. Uh, so at $4 per MMBTU, even $3.50 per MMBTU, it's unlikely that coal-fired power generation goes below 35 percent, 38 percent of the U.S. total. Most of the projected growth in demand is uh, expected to be met with uh, natural gas, uh, given the new source performance standards uh, that, uh, that John mentioned. It's unlikely that we're going to build a new coal-fired power plant under current regulations. Uh, and most of that load gets met by natural gas and some nuclear and renewable. Uh, but because natural gas is relatively cheap, there is a lot of dispatch in the country that is kind of on a razor's edge, where the marginal economics between coal and natural gas uh, are very small, which means that small changes in power market incentives can have a big impact on dispatch. Uh, so what we see in one of our scenarios, and this is the national cooperation without efficiency crediting that you see on the right is that emission standard that is proposed in the, in the clean power plan shifts the incentives in favor of natural gas uh, in a way that leads to a pretty large change uh, in uh, dispatch. And that natural gas is at a national level the least cost means of complying with the emission rate standards uh, the EPA has put forward. So some increase in, uh, in renewables, uh, a little bit of an increase in nuclear, but the vast majority of the change in generation is a coal to gas uh, switch. In part, that's because gas is cheap. In part, it's because we have uh, a large number of natural gas combined cycle power plants uh, that have available capacity. And because building new natural gas combi combined cycle plants is relatively inexpensive compared with other generation options. We see that dynamic across all of our policy scenarios. The magnitude just changes. So in scenarios where this is the change in generation on average between 2020 and 2030 relative to a baseline, uh, and the magnitude varies depending on how much efficiency is credited. So if states credit efficiency as a compliance mechanism, that means you have to do less fuel switching. Uh, so the downside for coal generation is smaller and the upside for natural gas generation is smaller. But in all of those scenarios, gas remains uh, the least cost compliance pathway. And then we tested that against a number of gas market sensitivities. So what if the shale resource turns out to be lower than currently expected? Uh, what if we export large quantities of LNG? Would that change the economics of gas in the power sector and lead to another generation solution? And we find that by and large, gas remains, even in scenarios where we're exporting up to 18 BCF a day of natural gas by 2030, the shale gas resource base in the U.S. is currently estimated is large enough to both meet the, that export demand and uh, deliver large-scale fuel switching uh, in the electric power sector. Uh, to put that in context, that's, we, 
expect somewhere between three and 11 BCF a day of additional natural gas demand uh, as a result of clean power plan implementation uh, that depending on the extent to which efficiency is credited, uh, up to 14% increase in total natural gas demand uh, in the US. Uh, the vast majority of that met by an increase in domestic production uh, so an almost as large increase uh, in domestic uh, output. Uh, on the flip side, that means a fairly large decline in U.S. coal consumption and coal production, uh, up to a 40 percent decline uh, in U.S. coal production as generators switch from, uh, from coal to natural gas. Uh, and again, in scenarios where efficiency is credited, the downside for coal is lower, just as the upside for natural gas uh, is, uh, is smaller. When you put dollars to those quantity changes, uh, the, uh, the impact is, uh, is fairly large, uh, up to a $32 billion a year increase in natural gas uh, production revenue nationwide, uh, and a, um, I can't see the numbers from here, a, uh, the, oh, this is prices that I'm looking at here, sorry, just need a new prescription for these glasses. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, this is uh, the price. Uh, the price impact is relatively uh, relatively modest because of that flat shale curve. So I think up to eight nine percent increase uh, in uh, wellhead prices, a much lower increase in delivered prices, two three percent increase in delivered natural gas prices uh, uh, across uh, across scenarios, uh, and uh, and a decline in uh, uh, coal prices. So you add the change in quantity to the change in price, and uh, up to a thirty two billion dollar year increase in natural gas production revenue uh, and almost as large decrease in coal production revenue. And when you stack those changes in, up, uh, changes in upstream uh, supply alongside the changes in downstream energy expenditures, uh, it's clear that, you know, if you're thinking about your equities as a state or as a company in the clean power plan, you really need to look beyond uh, the electric power sector, that the upstream changes are likely to be uh, the most significant uh, dynamic from an economic standpoint, that shift from coal to uh, natural gas uh, and renewables, uh, potentially larger than the increase in energy expenditures uh, as, uh, as a result of the uh, policy. Uh, so John's going to kind of walk through what that means for specific states and regions of the country and uh, how different stakeholders think about their interests in this uh, implementation discussion. Thanks, Trevor. Um, so. We saw, Trevor just went over kind of some of the national impacts and how they're quite substantial upstream and not just looking at the, uh, the downstream impacts. So now I'm going to break it down with a few select deeper dives in a few regions, but I wanted to give you some high-level thoughts on this first. So first of all, these are the regions we use in the report. These are U.S. Census regions. Uh, pick your favorite color and keep track of it as we go through. This will um, we'll be, we'll be uh, carrying through this color scheme through the next few charts. Uh, so first of all, this is not our output. This is EPA's output. What, we, what I wanted to start with is uh, when you look at what the EPA projects for emission reductions under its uh, state implementation scenario and its uh, modeling of the Clean Power Plan, you can kind of get a sense of relative effort uh, expected uh, for across these different regions. And so this, that's what this is here. This is the per capita emission reductions on, on, on an annual basis on average between 2020 and 2030 uh, by census regions. So you notice that they are not all the same number. Uh, and that's a product of the building blocks and how EPA designed the emission rate goals based on opportunities for reductions as opposed to everybody does X percent reductions of some, some amount. And uh, you can see the West South Central region, the purple up there, for example, is, is a little over three tons per person, which is quite substantial compared to, say, the Pacific, which is just 0.1 tons. Uh, and, you know, I think EPA would be the first to say, this is not exactly the way they expect everything to play out. It, the Clean Power Plan is a very complicated beast, and we don't know where it's going to lead yet. But this gives you a sense of relative effort under the current proposal. Uh, and if you take that another, and extrapolate a little further, you say, okay, well, relative effort equals relative cost, uh, which is probably not a perfect one-to-one, -one, but it gives you a sense of where, where you might expect the biggest impacts to take place. Um, but we found that when you look beyond the electric power sector impacts, first of all, electric power sector impacts don't always line up with what you just saw in that previous chart. But then when you go beyond that and look upstream at the energy market impacts for coal and gas, uh, the story completely changes. So this is uh, just our, our one scenario, the national without EE scenario. I'm putting this up more to kind of 
prove the concept, and then we'll dive in a little deeper on a few regions. But uh, on the left-hand side is, thanks, uh, is the uh, production revenue. So dark, dark shaded is natural gas production revenue, light shaded is coal production revenue. Uh, and then on the right, uh, the other side is energy expenditures with dark being electricity and light being all other energy. So gasoline, natural gas, any, any other energy besides electricity. Uh, and in this scenario, you see uh, within all regions, electricity expenditures, electric bills go up. So without EE in this particular scenario, everybody sees slightly higher electric bills. Uh, but they're, they're relatively modest changes in, in when you think about $400 billion in electric bills na nationally, for example. And then uh, when you look upstream, the scale completely changes. So West, uh, West South Central, for example, sees that a $17 billion uh, upside for natural gas, uh, which is uh, almost 17 times as much as the electric tower, power sector impacts for that, for that same region. So um, this illustrates that uh, different regions and states within regions are going to have very different equities uh, as they approach clean power plan implementation when they consider all of these different aspects, both electric power side and, and upstream for energy production. And uh, it's important to think about these things when engaging in, in after the rule is final and trying to figure out what you're actually going to do. Uh, so speaking of what you want to do, if I, uh, I, we've been in the report, we posed two questions that we think states should be contemplating here, uh, which is if I'm a state, I want to answer what do, I, what do we want to do in our state and what do we want everybody else to do? Because some of these impacts, in particular the upstream ones, are contingent on everybody else's actions, not necessarily your state's actions. So all of these uh, answers are really going to come from uh, uh, a lot of different factors and they're all going to be different across states, such as generation and natural resource mix. Uh, your existing energy and climate policies, how your power market is structured, whether or not it crosses state boundaries, what EPA ultimately assigns for an emission rate goal for your state, and what your stakeholders want. Uh, and all, not all of those things are going to line up perfectly for any state. Uh, and so what we thought we'd do is take a few of our regional results and do a, uh, a closer look at a few regions. So. Uh, we've called out West, West South Central because it, it really does have this gigantic upside for natural gas. And you can see, you can see in the top corner there, those, those are the states. It's Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And uh, basically, on, uh, the upside is, is by far the largest any region in the country. Uh, these are big natural gas producing states anyway. And they, they happen to be a, a big, deep area of additional supply if you need it. And uh, that upside gets maximized so long as no other states do energy efficiency, which is kind of an interesting outcome. And, and if you're a Texas or an Oklahoma, you might be thinking about what you might ask your neighbors to do or not do in their clean power plan uh, design. Uh, cooperation with other states really brings down the cost for this region. Uh, part of that is, is a function of how the clean power plan stringency changes through cooperation. Uh, so working together in a broader market provides more compliance op opportunities and really lowers the cost. Uh, and, uh, if you had to do one thing, cooperate or do EE, uh, cooperation gets you a lot more cost savings in this region anyway than EE. EE certainly helps. Uh, it helps everywhere from an energy cost perspective, but uh, cooperation has the bigger magnitude impact for this region. Uh, on to the mountain states. Uh, again, you can see this is a much larger region geographically, uh, which also has a, a, a non-trivial upside for natural gas, uh, uh, quite substantial, around $5 billion a year in our no EE scenarios, but an even larger downside for coal. This is home to the Powder River Basin, uh, where half of the coal production in the United States comes from. And uh, you can see uh, the overall uh, impacts between those two are going to be obviously pretty, pretty tangible for folks, um, in particular because the, the coal downside can be mitigated to, what, to some degree if other states do around the country do EE crediting. Uh, cooperation in this region is, is important for a lot of other reasons, not just cost reductions. Uh, you know, this region is home to a huge amount of renewables, in particular wind and solar, and uh, not a lot of demand. So they, uh, some of these states export at least 50 percent of their generation towards the coast, towards, towards the west coast. And so getting cross recognition and, and of those renewable resources in everybody else's plans uh, is going to be very important. And if you cooperate in a single plan, that's the single easiest, most efficient way to do that, um, at least as the current plan is proposed. Uh, it also gives some of these states much greater compliance flexibility. flexibility. Some of these states have a handful of regulated units, and that's it. I think Idaho, Idaho has one. And so if I'm a state and I'm trying to figure out how to do this most cheaply, it's better to get more opportunities. Uh, and the only way to do that is to cooperate. 
Uh, moving on to the last one here, which is a, uh, an outlier in a different direction, uh, New England uh, has no upstream energy production, period. So uh, uh, with the exact, I mean, they have some in-state in electric uh, renewables and whatnot, but you know, from oil and, gas, uh, oil and gas and coal, they don't have any. So their equities are a lot different when they come to the clean power plan. They're, they're looking solely at the downstream impacts and how to manage those. Uh, and this region happens to be one that's had a long history of uh, carbon policy and clean energy policy and energy efficiency policy to build on. And going forward, uh, their least cost pathway based on our analysis is to uh, really just ramp up what they're already doing. Uh, you know, expanding uh, their cooperation uh, both in carbon markets but also ramping up other clean energy policies is going to keep their costs fairly manageable under this, under this regime. So with that, uh, we're going to switch gears a bit and hand it back to Sarah to talk more about uh, the infrastructure side of this because, you know, a lot of gas out of the ground means you got to do something with it. Got to put it somewhere. Uh, so thanks, thanks very much, John. I think one of the things that we wanted to focus on uh, in particular in this study and, I, and just as a sort of a caveat up front is um, uh, one of the other big reports that we're doing is uh, on sort of midstream oil infrastructure, and it's called delivering the goods. And, uh, you know, the big challenge in the energy industry is getting the resources you have to the place where you need it in a timely and efficient manner. And there's a lot of sort of cost and distributional issues associated with the ability to do that. And so uh, a lot of the work that we did was sort of predicated on the fact that we've gone through, and uh, I see Howard sitting in the front seat, so thanks to EIA for this uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful graphic that we used, uh, is, uh, is over the past you know, several years, we've seen a significant increase in the amount of you know, natural gas infrastructure that's been put in place to accommodate the surge. Uh, just the ability to sort of move the uh, increasing amounts of uh, shale gas that we've been producing uh, in various parts of the United States uh, to the places where they need to be, uh, not taking into consideration some of the sort of, you know, the, the um, more downstream oriented aspects of that investment cycle, but really just to get it from, you know, from the place that it's produced to the place where it can be utilized most, uh, most efficiently has been a fairly sizable uh, uh, undertaking, one that has, you know, slowed in recent years in terms of overall capacity, but certainly something that sort of, you know, several years back on the natural gas side alone, congestion in terms of, uh, of, of sort of moving infrastructure or getting infrastructure cited in time uh, to be able to economically produce some of these resources was a big topic that, uh, that we were dealing with. Um, and then there's been additional uh, uh, studies done that look at, and this one is uh, one that was uh, recently done in combination with ICF and Inga, uh, on just the projected amount of pipeline capacity needed over uh, the next several decades in terms of uh, uh, what will additionally be needed to move some of these shale gas resources to places where, uh, uh, where that resource will be required. These kinds of estimates, however, don't take into consideration what we focused on in this study, which was uh, where could the significant increase in demand and production be as a result of these clean power plan uh, projects uh, or excuse, clean power plan uh, uh, implementation efforts. And so we didn't, uh, we were not able to calculate the actual number needed in terms of capacity additions to match uh, the demand. But it, when you look at sort of the range, and particularly we've sort of circled the places uh, on the map here where, in, in sort of, this is a map you all know sort of with the shale gas, uh, 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 where the resource basins are. Uh, the previous two charts have shown sort of where the capacity additions have been placed uh, in terms of needing to move, uh, to move resources from sort of the supply surge. The question going now forward is how much capacity may be added over what time period in terms of the response to clean power plan implementation to additional capacity, uh, uh, generation uh, uh, capacity on the natural gas side to new sort of uh, new generation capacity added uh, on the natural gas side will be required and what will be required in terms of, uh, of the pipeline infrastructure to get it there both, both from an interstate and an intrastate perspective. Um, we think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done here. The reason why we flagged it was uh, as much as we, and you know, you know, be careful, Whitney does and look at me nasty, but like as much as we love models, they assume stuff gets built. Uh, and um, as our friends on the Hill will be actively debating, you know, most of the afternoon, infrastructure doesn't always get built, right? And it's not saying that natural gas infrastructure is nearly as politicized from that perspective. But the 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 question is both from sort of a transmission capacity and a pipeline capacity uh, perspective is what could what could the additional constraints. Um, 
uh, and or issues in, in thinking about the infrastructure that this might require for your region? How does that factor into, uh, as Trevor and John have both very eloquently said before, the sort of the perspective you bring to it in terms of your options, right? So for example, uh, the Northeast in terms of the ability to use a lot more natural gas demand is all predicated on their ability to get it there, and that is not a small uh, a small story at this point, right? So so if you if you want to sort of you know uh, reap the benefits or understand the benefits of additional natural gas within your supply system, or even uh, we we didn't do uh, we haven't mentioned really sort of transmission infrastructure, uh, 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 but that's also sort of an additional issue. There is sort of an infrastructure component here that does need to be considered uh, when you're making uh, those decisions, and so we think that there's probably a good deal more work to be done uh, in this area to understand it both at sort of the state and at the national level. Uh, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, sort of the really high-level version of what we did. There's a lot more detail, as we said, in each of the regional aspects, um, but sort of also uh, at the national level and, uh, and certainly happy to talk about that. I wonder if it might be worth sort of taking one second just to do uh, any clarifying questions, te please, technical clarifying questions. Uh, if not, what I'd like to do is move over to sort of our panel uh, and, uh, and sort of start the discussion about uh, maybe with with, uh, starting with Kate, um, we we sort of laid out a whole bunch of issues that we uh, we think are worth uh, folks at sort of the state and regional level to be considering. Um, but Kate's actually working with a lot of folks at the state and regional level to talk about what they uh, can or should be considering, and so to offer maybe uh, her perspective on what some of those issues are and how uh, and how you view uh, some of the the sort of cost benefits uh, uh, of some of these decisions. So if there are no sort of technical clarifying issues. There's two. All right, they're real technical clarifying issues. All right. <laughs> Fernando's right there, and then I'll come to you next, okay? Or right there. No, no, no. Great, thank you, sir. My question is pretty straightforward. In the model for the power plants that currently exist and those that might be projected in the future, is there some distribution of the reality of the size and efficiency of existing power plants to your gross model? or have you created some sort of a normalizing factor? How real is your analysis of existing power plant efficiencies and sizes that has a significant impact on the cost of the infrastructure, obviously, whether it's an 18-inch pipe or a 30-inch pipe, depending on the consumption factor and the efficiency factor? Can you give me a little bit of insight into that? Uh, you specifically talking about the gas plants? Yeah, I mean, we, we, it, it's, the existing plants are all representative of the current fleet. So they, they do represent different sizes, efficiencies, uh, uh, those types of things. For new, it's largely uh, kind of an off-the-shelf uh, typical plant. Like I think it's 500 megawatt capacity. Uh, they could run up to 85% capacity factor and have a heat rate somewhere in the 6,000. Yeah. For the existing fleet, yes. Did you include the cost of the gas infrastructure in your costs? Uh, meaning in, in like electric rates and things like that? When you had all your, your bar charts, you talk about new gas and whatever, are the costs of the infrastructure to move the gas included? In the delivered uh, gas prices, yes, yeah. Okay. So production prices, they don't, they don't pay that, you know, you're know. getting out of the ground. But yeah, no, delivered prices do reflect that. Good. Uh, so, hi, sorry if this is a little high level, but I'm a little befuddled why there is a circumstance with no energy efficiency in it. I, I just can't see any state not including energy efficiency. It's the one thing everyone likes. Uh, I can give you one quick example. All the Reggie states, they, they do a carbon, right now, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative does not explicitly credit energy efficiency. It's a mass-based program that everybody has to hold allowances. They have efficiency policies that run alongside the carbon policy, but that's different than explicitly crediting energy efficiency as compliance for the carbon policy. Does that make it, see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a nuance that shouldn't matter all that much, but the clean power plan makes it matter, uh, just the way it's designed. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, uh, where states, I mean, and there's also several states that don't have the energy efficiency policies in place now. So, you know, whether or not they want to ramp them up, something brand new on top of something brand new is another question. But 
The other thing, just to be uh, in in sort of recognition of the sort of spirit of your point, is one of the reasons why we put up sort of the no EE scenario here was it was one of the bounds that helps yeah. make some of the points we were trying to highlight, right? So we have a, a, a range of scenarios that also include energy efficiency, and some of the data was included in that. And some of the charts, you know, take a little bit more time to look through actually do do that. But I think it was the cleanest, neatest way mm -hmm. to get around the highly complex issues about how you count energy efficiency and how much energy efficiency counts and is real. We had very, I, I'm much smarter on that than I ever was before after talking to these guys. Um, it is an active area of debate, and I think that one of the interesting things is we were going out and talking about and sort of socializing this issue, and I think we'll probably end up talking a little bit more about this, is there, there, you are correct, there is a lot of, you know, incentive to use energy efficiency from a lot of other constituencies out there as well. What we were trying to do here was just put some bounds around it, and this was the useful way of sort of showing some of the points that we were trying to highlight, but the report does go into sort of the other range of that as well, so I hope you'll take a look at it. I think probably uh, it would be good to sort of turn to Kate first, and then we'll, we'll turn to Erica after, but uh, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, how you take on what we've, uh, what we've put forward today. Sure, my pleasure, thank you. So my name is Kate Zyla, I'm the Deputy Director of the Georgetown Climate Center. Um, I am not a state, uh, but we, <laughs> we work with quite a lot of states um, on this particular policy and, and set of issues. We are based at Georgetown's law school here in DC and we do a lot of work on the Clean Power Plan, um, including providing a bunch of resources and tools and data, all kinds of stuff that you can find on our website, which is not what I'm mostly here to talk about today. We also convene a number of states to meet with each other and to meet with stakeholders to talk about some of the issues that come up for states in thinking about the Clean Power Plan and how states might comply with it. And so we hold a bunch of meetings where we bring states and power companies together to talk about their options and, and what ways they might comply with the plan. We also convene a group of, a smaller group of states that works together to discuss issues and submit comments that we facilitate to EPA. In December last year, this group got together and wrote a letter that was submitted to EPA. We're working together now on another set of comments that will come from a similar set of states uh, currently being finalized. I thought maybe they'd be out today to tell you about, but they're not quite ready yet, but coming very soon. And so we work with these states to figure out sort of what their questions are and what some of the issues are and to help them express their thoughts to EPA. And so that's some of the perspectives that I'm bringing here are things that we hear in talking to states through these variety of different fora. And I'll also say a few things about other things we're hearing from states, either through comments they submit to EPA or other things they say publicly, because of course the states don't all agree on any of these things. There are lots of different perspectives and the group that we're talking to might have a very different opinion than another group that someone else might talk to. So I'll try to bring a few of those perspectives together. Um, the first issue I'll, I'll note that some of the states we work with are focused on actually sort of gets to this last question about why might you not include energy efficiency. And, and one of those reasons you might not include energy efficiency is that EPA takes comment on whether the four building blocks they create are, should all continue to remain four building blocks. And one of the ones they take comment on is should energy, end use energy efficiency be one of the four building blocks. And so I think information like what you gain by including this building block is actually an incredibly helpful contribution to that, that piece of their, their question. And the states that we work with a lot generally are, are very supportive of the general approach that includes the four building blocks, the first one being sort of plant level heat rate type efficiency improvements, the second one being the shifts to natural gas discussed a lot here, the third one being more renewables and, and nuclear, and the fourth one being energy efficiency. And in general, that set of options, I think, well reflects the sorts of strategies that states have used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the past and continue to use. And so general support for that, that system-wide approach as opposed to a much more narrow or plant level sort of approach. Something else that's been really important to the states we work with is flexibility. The, the proposal lays out these four building blocks that EPA uses to set states' goals, but then the states meet those goals in any way, that's not any way, but in, in a variety of ways that they choose and they put into their plans. And that's something that really allows the states to, to lean on their existing programs and work they've already put into things like renewable portfolio standards, energy efficiency policies, 
mass-based programs like REGI and to really try to figure out how the system they have in their state, the resources they have in their state, the policies they already put in place and the ones they expect to put in place later can be packaged together into a plan that makes sense and achieves their goal. And so that flexibility has been really important to states too. There have been a lot of questions so far about the goal numbers, the stringency of them and how they relate to each other. I think you've seen a lot of sort of helpful context for that in the report here as well. You know, just questions about how did you come up with these numbers and is, is mine this, as equally hard as yours and how do we figure all that out? Is everyone being treated fairly, first of all, but also what does that mean for your incentive to work with your neighbor if, if your goal feels much more or much less stringent than theirs does? So a lot of these kinds of questions. EPA has recently come out with a notice of data availability that I think starts to answer some of these questions and, and there's a lot of time just spent sorting all of these details out. Um, likewise, another sort of data thing, you know, we've talked about how you might have these intensity-based rate system targets. You might convert that to a mass-based target. Part of the flexibility EPA provides is that states can do that, but there's been a lot of question about how do I know what my mass target is? How do I calculate that? Is what I'm doing now good enough? Hard to tell. And EPA has again come out with um, some technical documents recently that help states think through that process. But a lot of what they've been doing is just sorting out all of this data, all the data that was used to create the goals in the first place, these new technical support documents, these new guidance. It's, it's been a lot of trying to figure out, boy, what, what is my goal and, and how did they get it and do I agree with how they got it and, and what does it mean for me? And so I think the conversation, while has been really meaty and technical, has, has been sort of early, and I think a lot of the things that we're seeing here are sort of part of the, the evolution of the conversation over time. Uh, one of the things that has already come up quite a bit today is the potential for multi-state collaboration. As, as the report shows, there are a lot of reasons to work with your fellow states, uh, reducing costs for consumers, reducing administrative and compliance costs. You know, the bigger the region you have to work with, you can take advantage of more cost-effective reductions, can align better with the electricity system. And, and can provide flexibility if there are sort of market disruptions. When you have a bigger group working together, you can, you can sort of fill in these gaps better. Um, and states are really interested in figuring out what it means to collaborate. You know, I think there's a model, you can think about the Reggie system in the Northeast where nine jurisdictions do more or less the same thing in a compatible way. But you can also imagine collaborations that are not quite so you know, whole hog, right? You can imagine states that have you know, compatible renewables tracking systems or efficiency programs. You can imagine just platform consistency where they may have different pro policies and different rules, but they all say, well, gee, we're all tracking the same kind of compliance unit, whatever that may be. Let's, let's use the same system and just have the option of more interchangeability, even if their policies are really independent. And so a lot of question about what it means to have a multi-state program versus a single state program and how those might overlap if, if they're not you know, entirely overlapped. Um, a lot of questions about sort of enforceability, who's, who's, who makes sure this stuff happens, right? If you put state policies into a federal plan, does that mean that EPA then enforces your state's RPS? Just how does this all work? Um, and a lot of interest in states in what EPA's proposal calls the um, state commitment approach where the states themselves sort of sign up and say, we'll put ourselves on the hook to make sure these reductions happen. We don't need you to be the enforcer of our particular policy. And another in the weed set of issues that goes back to the platform issue I mentioned, you know, how does all this get counted and, and verified and what are the systems in place for tracking and trading whatever these units are and making sure that they're not double counted, that they, we understand how they move or don't move across state lines and that everything is measured and verified and, and sort of rigorously counted. So a lot of technical details. Um, you see a lot of other states commenting already in the record. Uh, the Reggie states in the Northeast had a letter they submitted um, November 5th arguing that there are some real opportunities to strengthen the rule and suggesting that greater cost-effective reductions are achievable than were asked for in the rule. You'll see a lot of states submitting much more specific state related questions and issues. You know, Alaska comments on, on you know, whether it's appropriately included in the system since it's not connected to the other states. Um, Arizona questions sort of the way that interim goals are handled. Uh, Georgia questions the way that under construction nuclear power is handled, not surprising. Um, you know, Louisiana comments that its goals were incorrectly calculated and, and 
also suggests that the whole system of calculation is, is just not appropriate. So you see a range of comments and submissions from states, I think also a range of ways of engaging, with some states really trying to sort of see how they can make the rule as effective as they can, and other states saying, we really don't like this and we don't want it to happen. Um, there are a couple of lawsuits happening already, um, one by Murray Energy that was joined by nine states, um, although 14 states uh, filed a brief in support of EPA in that same lawsuit. Another group of states very similar to the first filed a separate lawsuit. These are going to be um, heard together in the D.C. Circuit Court in the spring. And then you see some state legislatures getting involved with their own sort of perspective on the issue and in a couple of states passing laws that limit the way that the state could comply with the rule. Um, in Kentucky, there's a law passed that limits the state plan to measures that can be undertaken at the EGUs themselves, rather than the broad basket of system-wide policies that EPA would allow the states to do. And in Pennsylvania, you have a law recently passed requiring legislative review of the state plan by both houses of the state legislature. And so you see legislators trying to figure out how they will start to play and what the state decides to do. So a really wide range of perspectives and approaches taken by the states. I think one of the interesting things is sort of what happens now, and I think you'll see a theme in some of those comments that were really about what is in this proposal and, and what does it mean for us? And I think you see those conversations now shifting to, okay, what do we do about it? And, and how do we figure out which of these choices works for us? And I think one of the primary ways they'll start to figure that out is with data and analysis. And, and the states have really limited resources to conduct this sort of analysis on their own. They're expensive and hard and take a lot of time and effort and staff. And, and there's just a huge appreciation we hear from states for work like you all are presenting today and data to help them sort through what their choices are. As, as several of these folks have mentioned, you know, what the states, the way they approach the plan affects significantly the results to the economy, the costs and benefits they'll see, and trying to understand what their options are, it's really helpful to have this kind of data available. Um, and also, again, it matters what your neighbors do, right? So as you're trying to figure out, all right, I'm a state, what do I do? It matters what your neighbors do, and it matters for what your region does. And so, again, this is all really valuable input to, the, to their conversations. Um, I think as they go through sort of what their choices are, they're thinking about a lot of different kinds of costs and benefits, including obvious ones like electricity prices and um, electricity flows and pollution reduction and public health and other economic benefits. I haven't heard as much so far about some of the upstream impacts that, that you all have, have really highlighted today, um, not because they aren't important, but I think largely because we haven't had this sort of information. And so I think this will be a really helpful contribution to their conversation, and I really appreciate your inviting me here to talk about it. I think there was a, a great array of some, you know, some of the issues. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, is I didn't, I didn't hear you say much about sort of timing, right? And so to the extent that, you know, a lot of what we were sort of talking about and looking at was about sort of optimization, right? And optimization is great, but like, you know, it doesn't always happen for everybody. Um, to the extent that the, the pace of, of, you know, what sort of, you know, is, has been put on the table, does, do you have a sense that it sort of drives people more towards, as they're sort of shift to, okay, what are our options, more towards how, does, how could we do this in a way that complies with our existing system, which is the point you started with, right? You know, is, uh, how can we not, uh, not shift things too much because that, that, that may, may make it harder to meet sort of what is already being sort of deemed a, a, an aggressive time scale? Sure, yeah, they're, they're certainly thinking about the timing and, and that's part of sort of how, how hard or easy this is, right? One of the comments that, that a lot of people have had that is a little farther in the weeds than I was, I was starting to go, um, but there's a lot of question about the, the pace that use of the different building blocks implies. And this is part of what came out in the notice of data, data availability you put, EPA put out recently, which is that there seems to be this requirement that if you're using a lot, that, that the natural gas shift building block needs to happen faster than the other building blocks in order to get to the sort of average um, rate by the, by the interim time period. And so a lot of question about the interim goals is related to the timing and how, depending on the approach you'll use, how quickly you have to get there. And there's a sense that the natural gas piece was expected to, to ramp up too quickly and that it might 
lessen the flexibility states have to meet the target in a number of different ways. And so that's one of the pieces that EPA responded to with the, the NOTA and that I think has been helpful for states to reflect on because there's this interplay between all of the flexibility and the ways that you get to the goals, but also the, the different expectations about how quickly that can happen and ways that that might inadvertently shift you from one choice to another. Um, well, hopefully we'll have, we'll have a little bit more of a discussion about some of that in addition to sort of what the, the additional pieces of information that the NOTA sort of put on the, on the table for people to consider. Um, Erica Bowman is the Vice President for Research and Policy at the American Natural Gas Association, and um, she's actually kind of like the perfect person to have on the panel uh, because she's at, at once both sort of an electric power expert, but then also very much understands sort of the upstream perspective and has been working on it uh, with a, uh, from, from her position at Inga. I thought maybe if you could share some of your thoughts about sort of the perspectives you're hearing from those who sort of produce and, and distribute natural gas on how, that perspective on the rule and the potential uh, upstream side of that, and then also to the extent that you are dealing with policymakers at a st state and local level, how much this message is or isn't resonating in terms of your perspective on how they rank those list of things that Kate was just talking about. Sure, great, uh, and thank you so much for, for having me today. Uh, just a quick uh, talking point on what ANGA is. So <laughs> ANGA is America's Natural Gas Alliance, and uh, we represent uh, several larger independent uh, natural gas production companies in the United States. So if you combine our membership production, we represent about a third of natural gas production overall. Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, we, we actually in our industry have are similar in the states in that we have varying views on the rule itself. Um, ANGA as an organization, we're not taking a position on the rule. Uh, we're not opposing it or supporting it, uh, but we, we do want to actively engage in it and, and speak about, you know, the benefits that natural gas has to offer, certainly the abundance and the affordability of that, and, and, and try to address any concerns that, that may come up be as these discussions go, go forward. Um, but you definitely have, have a range of views in the industry. I think kind of more on, uh, there's, there's some that, that look at this rule and think of it as, as another piece of regulation and, and concern around, uh, well, what's next? You know, if, if we're gonna be regulating the power sector this way, does this impact the natural gas upstream? Does it pack, impact oil upstream? Um, and then you have other companies that are looking at it from an opportunity perspective, certainly looking at all the, the resource results that CSIS has produced. Um, you know, there is some opportunity there for natural gas production uh, to, to reap some benefits, depending on how the rule kind of comes out in proposed form and certainly how states choose to comply with the rule. Um, but one of the, the, I think, from our perspective, uh, one of the biggest concerns that we have is, is more, more broad. It, it does apply to electricity in that electricity rates can drive manufacturing. Uh, and there's certainly been a lot of talk about the industrial renaissance coming back to the United States, a lot of more, a lot of onshoring happening because of low natural gas prices. And one of the, the things that we've been thinking about and, and trying to understand a bit more in detail in our own analysis of the rule is if you were to move, if, if states were to choose a mass-based system, because there is flexibility as the rule stands now that they could do so, it, will that type of choice from a policy perspective impact your economic growth as opposed to a rate-based perspective. Um, because if you do a, a total cap on your emissions, uh, you, you really, at that point in time, you're saying, you know, this is a priority. <laughs> this is a priority that, you know, we hit these emission targets and you could have credit prices or allowance prices go very high depending on how stringent that particular cap is. If you do a rate-based system, it, it, it's a little bit different because it, it, it's shaped more like a subsidy to, to those who generate credits and, and a cost to those who have to buy the credits. But you, you have a rate that you're able to, you know, as long as you're meeting that rate, it doesn't necessarily matter the amount of electricity that you're consuming. Uh, it's the fact that the amount of carbon that you're producing while consuming that electricity is, is at a certain level. So if you think about it from a broader climate perspective, and we're onshoring manufacturing processes from China, India, depending on whichever country it is, that, and we have a lower carbon rate, and we're producing more goods in the U.S., we may actually increase U.S. emissions, but overall, in the net benefit to the climate, we actually may be reducing. So that's something that we've been trying to figure out um, 
So in, in our own analyses, we've, we've kind of determined that a rate-based approach is more effective uh, in terms of not limiting uh, your, your growth opportunity from that economic perspective, especially as it, it's associated with our, our abundant natural gas supply. The other piece that uh, is, is certainly been cropping up is, is the question around infrastructure, uh, today's infrastructure associated with natural gas and its deliver, deliverability to electric generating units. Um, it's, it, the clean power plan is interesting because its standards are, are based on an annual, annualized rate level. So over the course of a year, uh, you need to hit that rate, where a lot of the concerns and, and discussions that are occurring uh, come from reliability, uh, people who are, are thinking about reliability, as they should be, uh, certainly reliability organizations, um, those utilities that need to serve electric cu customers, et cetera, uh, they're thinking, well, if I have a peak day, like a peak winter day, and I need natural gas to serve both my residential and commercial customers that use natural gas for heating, but I also need natural gas to generate electricity, is my pipeline that I currently have in the ground big enough to do both? Especially when you have such a large d heating demand uh, during, during that time frame. But again, the, the EPA in there, in, in the as the rules propose, it is an annualized number. And so you could theor theoretically say, well, you don't need to use natural gas during those peak heating times. Uh, you can send that gas to residential commercial customers and you can use a different type of generation, whether it be coal, oil, um, nuclear, or some other dispatchable form, or maybe you have more renewables that are, are producing that day, whatever it is. Um, so, so that's something that I, I think needs to, people need to remember when they think about the rule itself and from an infrastructure standpoint. Because when you, when you look at the peak design of different pipes to serve the, the large heating demand during the winter season, and you compare those winter months, and you can, then you look at the non-winter months and then the level of natural gas flowing through those pipes, you're looking at about a 60% flow rate through the pipe capacity throughput compared to their peak design. So for seven months out of the year, you have about 40% on average headroom to serve additional electricity generation. So that, that's something that I think, you know, it, it's a discussion around the reliability and it, there should be that discussion. Um, but there's also a real discussion around, you know, maybe we just have to operate our grid differently. Maybe we use existing assets. They have to be um, paid the appropriate money to, to stay around so that they have the revenue to make them whole. Um, but, but maybe you operate your grid differently. Maybe you operate coal for a few months out of the year, and the rest of the year you're, you're really ramping up natural gas to comply with your clean power plan. Um, so those are some of the, the things that we've been looking at from an indu industry perspective. I uh, certainly really appreciate CSIS and all, all the work they do and, and look forward to look at what Georgetown uh, has also been looking into as well. So thank you. Thanks, Erica. That was really helpful. It, one of the things I was sort of wondering in as sort of you ended your comments is there's, uh, uh, you know, a, a discussion of how to uh, really smart ways to incentivize uh, greater reliability and thinking about the way that you operate the grid. And so one of the things that we were talking about in the, over the course of the study was uh, a very simple question is who, who are the relevant decision makers in sort of deciding, you know, ways in which to optimize your compliance with this, uh, uh, with the rule and how to get over some of the reliability or infrastructure or other sort of needs and considerations. Ha have you guys thought about, and I know you said you weren't taking a position nor, you know, sort of providing comments or things like that, but um, on the best way to sort of bring about a discussion about some of those issues from a from an industry perspective, because right? you sure. you certainly, in in all fairness, sort of talked about a, a a broader perspective than than just the upstream perspective, right? I mean, sort of natural gas end users thinking about sort of you know the uh, having memories of some of the volatility that you know high gas demand or high gas surplus could bring uh, if not managed appropriately. How, how are you guys sort of thinking about? talking about ways of engaging positively on that. Right. Um, we, are, we are writing submitting comments on the proposal itself, just f for clarity. Um, in terms of you know, the different organizations that we work with to address some of those, those issues, it's certainly the, the regional transmission authorities or operators, so uh, New England ISO, uh, PGM ISO, MISO, 
all the ISOs, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at this and they're trying to figure out, well, how, how, how can I deliver reliability because that is their number one goal. Uh, and, and then that, that also feeds up into FERC, into the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So we're engaging at, on, on that level, uh, but it's also at the state uh, public utility commissioner level too, uh, just education around really, you know, peak, peak days, peak demand days versus, um, you know, annualized numbers, but also the cost to, to the cost that's incurred to build that new pipeline. So let's say that a region determines that, yes, we do need more pipeline and we want to move forward with that. Uh, for instance, New England. New England has you know, had very large basis differentials for many years, uh, meaning that they've had high prices during the winter, uh, and they have low, pretty reasonable prices during the, the non-winter months. Uh, it, it's been a challenge for them to build the additional pipeline that they need uh, to support electric generation because the generators that use the natural gas uh, are not able to recover that firm transport cost uh, in the marketplace. So that, that really becomes a discussion around, well, you know, is there a way that you could change your market rules, your market tariffs uh, to address that problem? Um, so, so those are kind of the dialogue, the discussions that, that we're engaging in. And, and there may be different solutions. It, it may not be that solution, but there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to go about it. Maybe just to pick up on the point about sort of transmission infrastructure, which we haven't really, you know, talked too much about, but the, uh, John, I don't know if you want to talk about it within the context of how, how we discussed it in the report, but um, it, we focused a lot on, you know, the potential for additional natural gas supply infrastructure, but it, given different scenarios and different pathways for the ways in which you could meet, you know, the, the sort of increased demand, one question is about sort of what kind of requirements would be out there in terms of transmission infrastructure, uh, especially in, in certain regions, which, you know, obviously has not necessarily been easier to build than in the other infrastructure. So I guess two questions along those lines. Is that something else that you guys have been looking at sort of along, along the same, you know, sort of reliability sort of uh, uh, lines? But then also maybe, Kate, from, from your perspective, I mean, does the, the, the need to build infrastructure or the desire to avoid building infrastructure sort of rank up there in some of the considerations that uh, that you're hearing from states as well? Um, yeah, so so we do engage a little bit. Uh, I, I don't think we've been as actively engaged on the, the transmission side of things, uh, but it is something that should be thought about because, I mean, you really could, some people talk about, they call it gas by wires, where, you know, you, you do have a very, I mean, uh, there's, a very large production going on now in the Northeast, and when I say Northeast, I mean Marcellus, which is Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, and, and it's it's sitting, you know, very close to obviously the East Coast, which is a huge huge load, population density. You, know, you have something very unique that we haven't had before, and that is a large large production basin sitting right right near demand. So, you know, in theory, you, you could build uh, electric wire, wires instead of the pipes to serve those electric generators. Um, but again, it, it gets down to cost. What's the, the least cost solution to doing that? And, and certainly it gets down to what customers and, and those who are impacted by such projects, you know, what, how, how they feel about it too. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's certainly a concern and, and, and states you know, know for you know, themselves what their own constraints are and, and where they're where they're limited and where they're not, and, and it's it's very top of mind. I think the trick is translating what they know about their own situation to the policy options at their fingertips now, and saying, okay, well, I know, I know I'm going to have a hard time getting that built, or or that's that's been a problem so far. But what does that mean for whether I should do a rate-based system or a mass-based system, and whether I should work with other states? It's it's there's just so many variables to sort through that I think it's, it's definitely one of the things they're factoring in, but it's just this big puzzle of trying to figure out, given what I know and what I don't know, what's next? Yeah. Well, and you know, I guess that was one of the following questions I had for your comments as well was, you know, the flip side of flexibility, flexibility is complexity, right? And so to the extent that people are looking for a little less flexibility or a little bit more certainty on, on certain things rather than the others, I mean, do you think that 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 ultimately the the sort of patchwork of responses that you get from folks at the state and local level on sort of what what they would like to see more clarity on versus where people would like to retain their flexibility is there kind of like a coalescing point there or is it uh, yeah I think I think part of that we saw in the the documents the EPA has just released in the last couple of weeks I think you know they heard pretty early on requests from states and others for 
here's stuff we'd like to, before we even give you comments formally, here's the stuff we'd really like more clarity on. And I think that's what you saw come out in the notice of data availability and in the, the rate to mass translation technical support document. You know, states are saying, I don't, I don't know if I want to do a mass-based program because I don't know what my mass-based goal would be and if it seems harder or easier, you know, can you help us figure out sort of what our starting point would be? And I think a lot of, a lot of those clarification questions were, were what came out of these recent documents. And so I think now that those are out, states can you know, dig in and say, okay, well, all right, now I know what my choices are a little bit more clearly. And now can I figure out, again, how do I make that choice? And I, I think that really is where the analysis comes in is that you know, there are, there are so many options on the table, and, and it's not a, a resisting of the options. It's just looking for guidance and, and resources and data information on how to evaluate which will be in our interests, which ones will, will you know, help us reduce costs, which ones will make the system more reliable and, and more seamless. And I think this sort of is the next phase of the discussion now is, all right, now we know what we've got. <laughs> how do we figure out how we actually comply? And uh, uh, hi, Rick. Welcome. Uh, uh, we've told everyone you're coming, so. <laughs> but maybe in a, an effort to give you a second to catch your breath, um, and sorry, Trevor, to put you on the spot for a second. One of the things I thought was interesting about um, uh, some of Erica's initial comments and the perspective that we've heard reflected from a lot of folks who think about, um, you know, oh gosh, price signals for producing their gas, but also selling their gas, and something we tried to take into consideration in the report is. Um, folks sort of, you know, from, from a, an oil and gas upstream perspective, trying to figure out whether or not you can have your cake and eat it too, right? And, and are there competing sources of gas use that drive up prices that then sort of erode, you know, the ability to use gas, say, for, you know, the petrochemical or the, the sort of uh, um, uh, manufacturing side of the equation, which, you know, quite frankly, for refining and everybody who's very energy intensive has been sort of a big deal. And you did a different study earlier on sort of like the potential benefits of that and sort of um, uh, the, the natural gas price responsiveness of some of that investment from, from a competitive perspective. I mean, is, is there anything you wanted to add on that point about um, uh, whether or not sort of, you know, increased gas demand in the context of, uh, of sort of power generation uh, under the CPP would be sort of a competitive dynamic for the gas sector. I, mean, I think a lot of what we looked at in sort of trying to imagine the highest gas or the lowest availability, high, highest gas demand or lowest availability suggested that the resource base is pretty responsive, but I didn't know if you want to add any color to that. You know, I think that's right. I mean, we in, in our kind of most extreme scenario, which was combining 11 BCF a day of additional gas demand in the power sector with 18 BCF a day of LNG exports. And, you know, the price impact was still relatively modest. Now, it could turn out that the shale resource in the U.S. is not as robust as, uh, as in the kind of current uh, annual energy outlook, although the kind of experience to date has been a kind of improved outlook on gas availability as times progress, not a decreased um, outlook on gas availability. I think I'm, I'm probably less concerned about uh, then, Erica, about the impact of the CPP on a nascent um, manufacturing revolution in the U.S., in part because we have yet to see actually any tangible evidence of said manufacturing revolution. Um, there has been an increase in manufacturing output in the U.S., but it's mostly been in non-energy related sectors or in sectors uh, attached to energy production, so steel pipe manufacturing, truck manufacturing, the kind of energy intensive manufacturing that you would expect to see uh, benefited by lower cost uh, energy in the U.S., uh, our trade position in those goods has actually deteriorated, um, which is not surprising because our trade position in energy is improving, and so we're suffering from a very modest form of Dutch disease uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, I mean, industrial rates are you know, six, seven cents per kilowatt hour on average in the U.S. now. Um, I think in our most aggressive scenario for CPP implementation, they go up to, you know, eight, eight and a half cents. Industrial electricity rates in China are 12 and a half cents on average. Uh, right now, they're, you know, 15 cents on average in Japan, 14 cents in uh, Europe. So it's hard to imagine a kind of policy uh, environment in the U.S. that closes any of that gap for electricity. And the share, uh, the parts of the U.S. manufacturing complex that are most directly 
benefited by the shale revolution. It's because of the direct gas and NGL feedstock. It's not because of electricity prices per se. Uh, so the exposure would be more on the increase in gas demand. Uh, well, Rick, uh, in the interest of sort of bringing you into the conversation here, you know, uh, what, you've uh, you've seen the report, but probably not read every word of it. I can imagine. Uh, and uh, but one of the things that we, you know, is you know, sort of the crux of what we're trying to do is have a um, a conversation about bringing in a broader set of constituencies on the more full aspects of sort of the downstream and upstream impacts of uh, of what CPP implementation could mean, and you know. You, as being someone who's been in the administration, you know, since the beginning of it, realize sort of all the different perspectives we've had on sort of the energy revolution that we've undergone here in the United States, plus all of the sort of uh, environmentally oriented sort of regulatory uh, items that we've put on the table. I just wanted to sort of get your thoughts on how you're thinking about it at this stage of the game and uh, some of the things that we put forward in the report. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And I'll just um, make very brief comments and then happy to participate in the Q&A. Uh, I think that this report is a welcome reminder of a, a lot of things, but a couple that I would flag. You know, one is that uh, we really have seen um, the natural gas boom in this country as a central part of uh, both economic prosperity and climate action. Uh, and the Clean Power Plan is uh, certainly um, a, a central nexus of those uh, opportunities. Uh, and I think this report is a welcome reminder that uh, all the natural gas supply that we now benefit from uh, helps to make it uh, possible to both uh, cut emissions and grow the economy simultaneously. Uh, and the report does a very good job of laying that out and explaining the, the nuances of that. Um, and I guess I would just, uh, related to that point, uh, underscore the importance of the synergies between uh, solutions like renewables and natural gas. And we see uh, tremendous complementarity between those intermittent renewable sources and natural gas backup power uh, for the medium and long term, not just for the near term. Um, and then uh, I think the second thing that the uh, report notes that I would underscore is just how central the role of the states is in implementing the Clean Power Plan that EPA is putting forward. The Clean Air Act is deeply federalist in its, in its bones, and the Clean Power Plan uh, within the Clean Air Act is no exception to that. So states will really be very much in the lead in choosing how they proceed, and they'll have tremendous opportunities to design policies that work for their context and that maximize economic efficiency uh, and really work for their stakeholders and their circumstances. That's great. Thanks, Rick. Uh, John and Trevor, did you want to add anything uh, before I move to questions from the floor? No? Okay. All right, great. Uh, okay, well, we've got a couple ground rules here. Uh, please just state your name and your affiliation to the extent that you've got a question, put it in the form of a question, at least somewhere along the line. Uh, and <laughs> Howard's laughing, but we're, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and we'll take some questions, have a bit of a discussion. Let's start with Howard up here. I'm going to add a third rule. Wait for the mic. Sorry. Yeah, so. My question relates, uh, there's a lot of, there was emphasis placed in the presentation on the benefits of cooperation, uh, but it looks like the way the modeling was done is that for the national case, it was simply applied a national standard. So effectively, the benefits of, for a particular region would reflect both the, what I, I guess regular people would call the benefits of cooperation for a given set of separate state standards and the benefits for certain states associated with looking at a national average standard versus the standard they actually have under the program. So can you provide some insight into how the, what is presented as the benefits of cooperation actually divide up between the, the benefits of you know, having a national standard, which for some people is gonna be below the standard they have, for other people it'll be above the standard they have, and the actual benefits of cooperation for the standards people actually have. Sure, I can take a stab at that. And I think Howard's getting at one interesting aspect of the Clean Power Plan. It's, at least it's the June proposal says, I think the, no, the recent notice might change things a bit, but or could change things a bit. But uh, when, when you cooperate, you average your emission rate goals across that cooperative region. So if you are, say, a state with a very high goal, and you wanted to cooperate, you have very little t incentive to because most everybody else is going to have a more stringent goal than you. So why on earth would you cooperate, right? Because you effectively, as you average out that goal, 
your overall compliance <coughs> obligation gets more stringent. Uh, and the reverse happens if your emission rate goes below. Uh, in our analysis, our national case, we just took the, we followed EPA's guidance in one of its initial uh, technical support documents in the Clean Power Plan proposal and averaged out the emission rate goal to a national goal uh, and basically uh, leapfrogged over the question of why would a state cooperate if that emission, that effective emission, national emission rate goal would be more stringent than what they were currently facing. So we did that because the national goal is, is a bounding case for the overall national uh, benefits of, of cooperation, which is different than how that... You were showing benefits for specific regions. Yeah, yeah. So, so one thing I would say is that we didn't show them all here. They're all in the report. You can actually see some regions don't benefit from cooperation. You do see that in the report, where their, where their overall energy expenditures or electricity expenditures, anyway, go up in the national case because the emission rate goal is more stringent than the, they were facing. So we do discuss that. We do discuss this phenomenon of why on earth would I cooperate if that was the case and highlight that uh, in certain circumstances, states are going to have to talk about some sort of compensatory mechanism or other inducements to help everybody feel nice about playing together. Um, that difference in incentives changes a bit if you switch to mass-based mass rate, mass goals. So that's another thing we point out in the report and another thing that uh, I think the recent notice helps with. Uh, because then it, then it kind of locks in a certain amount of tons per state, and that doesn't change regardless of cooperation. Uh, so you do have a different game, so to speak, if you're all in a mass base. If everybody chooses that mass based path and then decides to try and cooperate, then if everybody chooses a rate-based path, then everybody tries to cooperate. At one, I mean, I think that this will be, um, if I was a political science professor, I would spend the next like three years assigning this to my students as like game theory, uh, real world example of game theory. And so I mean, again, the bottom line is like, <clears throat> if you did side payments and you cooperated nationally, you could structure it in a way that absolutely everybody would be better off than a world in which they weren't. The question is, what would the mechanism for said side payments be? <laughs> and uh, there are mechanisms that are available within power market regions, uh, uh, but that'll be the kind of fun part to watch is as states with disparate interests and cooperation talk to each other, can they broker side payment solutions uh, to come up with a, a collaborative scheme that is better on net for everybody uh, in, uh, involved. One, one quick thing I would add based on the notice of data availability that I found quite interesting, EPA openly contemplates setting, doing the building blocks on a regional basis. Uh, maybe different regions for different building blocks, but they look at that. And if you, if you were to take that approach, you should have less variability in emission rate goals across states, which would immediately bring states closer together in this type of decision-making process. Uh, it all depends on how, how EPA lands on it, but they are certainly asking for comment on, on those types of approaches, which could kind of narrow that, that gap. Uh, Rick, did you want to add anything? No, I think it was well covered. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, thank you for this excellent panel, and congratulations for the new report. I work at the Resources for the Future, um, and we're also doing a lot of research on clean power plant. And one of our, uh, through the rigid re um, research we had, is about the building block two and building block three. This sort of have already been covered by some of the panelists, but I want to also like throw this out for your free discussion is, um, is the building, adding building block three probably gonna dilute some of the covered technologies of the covered fleets because um, building block two is about re uh, dispatching into the natural uh, and GCC, but uh, building block three is adding up the renewable energy which is going to the denominator, which is probably gonna dilute the dispatch effects of the building block number two. Um, is that gonna be a concern or has that been modeled in any of your researches or that's totally not a concern at all? Uh, this is my first question. Uh, second question about probably I can put Richard into this discussion because you came in late, but about the legal risk of um, all four building blocks, they're probably gonna be, uh, since from what building block one to building block for even though there are some flexibility, they're going to be facing a uh, more stringent go. So states probably going to be less incentive um, to, uh, like you know, cover or get through all four building blocks. If not all are covered or in their final state implementation plan, what are the alternatives 
for them to achieve or for the whole nation to achieve that ambitious 26 to 26 goal that Obama, President Obama have already proposed in his conversation with China. So that's it. Yeah, that second question is definitely for Rick. Um, <laughs> uh, so on, on the building blocks, uh, I think one thing to remember is that there's the building blocks, and then once you have that output, then you then that's that's the goal, right? And that's independent of how you got there, as far as any policy that uh, you, a state might use to get to the uh, uh, overall goals. And I think in our analysis, you see that regardless of how the, those building blocks are set, uh, you know, it's it's largely a coal to gas switching exercise, uh, either with or without efficiency. Efficiency kind of re reduces that magnitude, but it still is building block two in the real world uh, does a lot more than building block two in the BSER, at least in our analysis. Uh, um, so I, I guess I'd just stop there. I mean, I, I don't, I, as far as concerns for diluting emission reductions, uh, again, I think the BSER is a calculation. Uh, it's a It's just a mathematical, uh, formula that, uh, you know, I think gets the incentives right as far as how it treats different technologies. So um, what I think what matters more is once you've got that goal, states setting up the right incentives to get, get and meet their own goals, whether they are least cost pathways to meeting that goal, or maybe they have other, other priorities in mind. But, you know, I think that that's the more important thing once the goals are set. And Rick? So let me start with a brief comment on the legal risk question, just broadly. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the Environmental Protection Agency uh, has a long track record of success with these kinds of efforts. So when you look at the history of uh, SOX and NOx and PM regulation uh, over a period of decades, um, the agency has been repeatedly sued and has repeatedly prevailed and has driven down uh, those pollutants uh, by some 80% uh, from their prior levels. Um, and so. It is true that there will be uh, litigation. I think that's uh, uh, almost uh, a certainty. Uh, I think it's equally true that the EPA uh, has an obligation under the Clean Air Act and recent uh, court rulings to move ahead with carbon pollution standards, and the power sector is clearly uh, the greatest opportunity for that in the near term. Um, so it is something that they uh, need to do and I think are uh, very much uh, moving forward deliberately and with a uh, strong legal foundation for. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, the role of the Clean Power Plan and overall uh, 2025 uh, target, uh, in the overall 2025 target just announced um, with, uh, with um, the same time that uh, President Xi Jinping of uh, China announced their target, uh, I would just say that the Climate Action Plan is a comprehensive plan. And when you look at the uh, set of things that are underway, uh, it's important to remember that. So we're not even talking about just energy CO2. Uh, we're talking, of course, about uh, non-CO2 gases. So um, in the case of methane, there's a uh, broad interagency approach that uh, spans from landfill methane to um, uh, voluntary measures in the ag sector to oil and gas uh, related methane emissions uh, and activity across all agencies in order to help uh, deliver the reductions uh, in that particular gas. Um, when it comes to industrial gases like hydrofluorocarbons, uh, we have a wide range of activity uh, both domestically and diplomatically. So the Environmental Protection Agency has something called the Significant New Alternatives uh, Policy Program or the SNAP program, I forget the exact acronym, but the SNAP program which uh, in involves uh, changing the status uh, of certain hydrofluorocarbons so that they can no longer be used in certain applications and green lighting certain alternatives. Uh, and that is underway uh, with important reductions coming from uh, EPA's efforts there. Um, there's also a big private sector push that we just announced in September at the White House uh, with some 700 uh, uh, megatons uh, worth of cumulative uh, emissions reduction uh, through 2025 um, from private sector leadership on HFCs. Um, um, and then on a global scale, uh, the President has made extraordinary progress in the context of the Montreal Protocol uh, with addressing hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, and this week they're meeting um, to see if it's possible to move ahead to the next steps in addressing HFCs in that context. And we're very committed to that and very excited about that prospect, uh, including what it would mean for market-based approaches to reducing HFCs domestically. Um, and then, of course, in terms of the energy CO2 question, uh, the Clean Power Plan uh, is central, um, but we also have uh, a wide range 
range of other uh, measures uh, in motion which will contribute to emissions reductions um, and lay a strong foundation for reaching the 2025 goal. Uh, so that includes um, uh, existing light duty vehicle standards for fuel economy, uh, which of course are going to double fuel economy by 2025. And as the vehicle fleet turns over, uh, that leads to greater and greater reductions um, in uh, oil consumption, uh, improving energy security and reducing carbon pollution. Uh, we're going to do another round of, in this case, heavy duty vehicle fuel economy standards, um, and, and so that'll help as well. Uh, Department of Energy continues to crank out uh, appliance efficiency standards that are saving consumers billions and cutting carbon pollution further. Um, and, and there's a wide range of other programs in motion addressing energy CO2, not to mention extraordinary market trends in our favor uh, with uh, the cost of things like solar photovoltaics plummeting uh, and um, lots of uh, movement on electric vehicles. In fact, just today we're announcing a new set of uh, private sector commitments at the White House um, to help propel electric vehicle markets. Um, and so uh, states are going to continue to help deliver uh, localities in the private sector, and we're going to have a comprehensive approach consistent with the Climate Action Plan to get the job done. Um, so anyway, extended answer to a simple question. <laughs> No, it was great. It was very helpful. Uh, Kate, uh, just, did you want to add anything on sort of the, the state perspective on the legality <coughs> question or whether or not the sort of the, the, the risk to illegality or the finding of illegality or the, uh, the just the time it takes to go through that process is a significant factor in, in that uh, sure. decision process? Yeah, I would say that as, as with everything else, that the state opinions on that will vary with some of them actively suing and saying the rule is, is, is not legal, and some of them saying that it really is the best system of emission reduction, which is what EPA is required to identify, because it does use the variety of approaches and policies that states are already using to drive down emissions. And so I, th I think you see opinions across, across the range, um, and I guess we'll see how that shakes out. Great. And we've got a question back there. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Patrick Wilson from the Babcock and Wilcox Company, which is an American technology company. And Rick, uh, we're very excited to have been a part of the Clean Air Act era. So my uh, question is really about, uh, really for Trevor, about how you characterize the market. We're a technology company, and so we're concerned that the administration's big climate goals globally that have been so in focus this week really count on the adoption of clean coal technology internationally. And the problem is there's no market, as you've already said. The market for new power in the United States is flat. And to the extent that any new power generation of any kind is going to be added is going to be natural gas. And there's not much innovation in creating power from natural gas. So the question is, the administration has doubled down on we got to have this great new technology we're going to implement around the world to reduce carbon emissions from coal, which is going to be the fastest growing uh, baseline, uh, baseload coal, uh, baseload power in the world. So where's that innovation going to come from? Because clearly, if there's no market in the United States, there's not going to be any coal innovation here. Uh, so I mean, there, it certainly wouldn't preclude the option for uh, deploying CCS on existing coal-fired power plants in the US, I imagine. I mean, I know the technology profile of that is. Uh, is different than for new coal-fired power plants. Uh, there was in the uh, in the U.S.-China joint announcement uh, a, uh, a mention of a joint uh, CCS demonstration uh, project. There, uh, there's uh, excitement around CCS for enhanced oil recovery uh, in uh, uh, in Canada as well as the U.S. and other places. Um, I mean, I think in general, one of the as states think about uh, about what they uh, the plans they put forward under the uh, under the clean power plan, I mean, one of the challenges is, as, as Sarah alluded to before, I mean, this is a plan that spans the 2020 to 2030 time horizon, and the technologies that you would deploy just to meet that 2020 to 2030 time horizon are not necessarily the same that you'd want to deploy to reach deeper levels of decarbonization over the long term. And now the 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 uh, clean power plant requirements are a floor, not a ceiling. And so states are, of course, free to think about what does a long-term low-carbon pathway look like for our state or region, and how does CCS factor into that? Do we want to position ourselves for deeper emission reductions post-2030, and what role should CCS deployment play in that, in that period?
I, I, and I would imagine the nuclear guys have a kind of similar set of cost concerns too. Natural gas is inflicting pain on lots of people, uh, not just. <laughs>
Hi there, Christy Tizak from Clearview Energy Partners uh, for Mr. Duke. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was the cross-agency effort on methane. Um, there was a memorandum in 2010 talking about uh, taking a broader approach to greenhouse gas emissions um, evaluation under NEPA. Um, is that something that might be part of accelerating our progress towards the more aggressive 2025 Beijing goal? Is that an, uh, another opportunity to, you know, look at, you know, especially like with this inf integration of infrastructure and, and large programs, is that another opportunity to, to find another increment of progress? Thanks for the question. I think that uh, when you look at the uh, Climate Action Plan, uh, what you see is an effort to look uh, comprehensively across all sectors of the economy and all greenhouse gases uh, and to apply uh, the existing authorities that the administration has to achieve emissions reductions uh, in those sectors and, and across those different greenhouse gases. Um, I think that uh, it's important to recall that when it comes to uh, NEPA questions, um, those in and of themselves are, are process-related uh, requirements. Um, so uh, I think that those are important process-related requirements, um, but really the focus of the Climate Action Plan and where we see the um, uh, ongoing opportunities uh, to reduce emissions uh, is through existing legislative authorities that uh, allow us to, to make that happen through uh, energy efficiency standards, through actions like uh, the EPA SNAP program that I just mentioned, through diplomacy, uh, through the EPA's Clean Power Plan, uh, and the like. Um, thanks. Uh, Francisco Deloshne from the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, so two questions. First, on the modeling, um, energy efficiency is a, is a key component to this. And in the scenarios where you have it included, how did you deal with the costs for implementation of energy efficiency? And the other question, both modeling and regulatory, renewables, in particular Canadian hydro, did you, did you see anything coming in on the modeling? And then on the regulatory side, would Canadian Hydro be potentially advantaged given that EPA hasn't necessarily clarified how to treat interstate renewables uh, in the proposal? I can start with the modeling questions. Uh, so with EE, we uh, actually beyond just costs, we adopted EPA's assumptions generally across the board for, for energy efficiency. There's a few small revisions to that. There's a lot more detail in the report on how we handle it. But uh, so the costs of EE are the same as what EPA assumed. We incorporate the utility, the cost that utilities incur for implementing EE into the rate. So those expenditure numbers you see for electricity include that cost. Uh, the participant costs that consumers uh, incur from EE is not included in that expenditure number. It averages about $20 billion a year uh, through 2020 to 2030, uh, assuming that the cost structure and that deployment. So, um, so we we are clear. Those numbers are all included in the report. We're clear about it, but that that covers that. On on Canadian Hydro, we saw very small but uh, non-trivial increases in imports from Canada. Generally, uh, I don't think we could differentiate what those were, uh, but you kind of know what it probably is. Uh, and uh, but that's because you have different incentives for generators across the board in the United States, and you have those transmission links, and that, that happens. Uh, but I think it's, I don't, it did not look like a lot of new capacity was getting built in Canada. It's just more energy flows. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, but I don't think our model could tell us much more than that uh, on that front. Great, thank you. My name is Frank Barone, and I'm a private investor. First, I'd like to thank CSIS for, once again, an amazing job of getting on top of these complexities and presenting it to at least the investment community at the level we can talk about it. I'd like to direct a question to Richard. You heard a lot about the strategic planning that's going on here, and you're an important part of it, like CSIS is. And you heard the gentleman from Babcock and Wilbots, and you're going to hear it from me. You know, we live in the tactical world. You know, we confront the markets day by day, moment by moment, and I think as as uh, Erica pointed out here, there's a large body of us that are in between those two points, the tactical instance and between the longer term strategic. Things like we were just talking about before, you know, last night I was informed by some of my co-investors in Hong Kong that China's making positive moves now to begin dumping coal on the world market. Huge amounts of coal, not small amounts, but huge amounts of coal. 
We also have significant rumors going on that Saudi Arabia may be getting ready to do the same thing on oil. We have two million barrels a day right now of surplus on oil, so we're engaged in a coal war and we're engaged in an oil war. We are engaged in an energy war. That's a very large thing to do. My question directly, Richard, to you would be, those bridge gaps between the long-term strategic issues that we have to deal with at the Babcock-Wilcox level, which could be many years, and the tacticals that we deal with moment to moment historically have had some assistance being bridged by taxation policy. Is the Obama administration involved in any bipartisan discussions at all that might lead to some tax administration changes to enable that bridge to be a little stronger than it currently is? Well, I appreciate the question, and it is uh, a very complex moment in uh, geopolitics of energy right now, and so I'm not going to comment on the specific uh, examples you mentioned, but it's certainly a dynamic time. Uh, I think, let me just briefly say, with respect to the Clean Power Plan, uh, since that's the main focus of the discussion today, um, back to the point about uh, states being in the lead on this, states and groups of states have extraordinary latitude to design durable, clear systems that provide a foundation for scale up of all the low carbon solutions. Uh, and so we will uh, encourage EPA to work closely with states uh, to help them uh, make that happen, but we also encourage uh, stakeholders to keep up the dialogue with EPA about what you think will work for your uh, interests and to allow that foundation to be as stable and clear and long-term uh, and successful as possible. Um, on the specific question, um, you know, we don't have any, uh, any announcements to make at this point on, uh, on the question of taxation. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Okay, I think we got time for one last question. The gentleman uh, in the fourth row back, the blue shirt right here. I um, just wanted to get back to EPA's NOTA for a minute. Um, I know you guys might not have, might not have had time to do this um, earlier. Uh, by the way, my name is Doug Obey from inside EPA. That's the EPA question. Um, EPA discussed treating natural gas a little bit differently in the NOTA, or maybe counting, I guess, more new gas generation, or counting it differently than they were thinking of doing it. And I was wondering how that might tweak some of the conclusions in your report uh, that you're releasing today, and if you don't have, you know, specific numbers or anything, can you give a qualitative sense of where that might affect some of the conclusions? Thanks. Uh, they put out a few different ideas in that notice, not, uh, not a few just around natural gas and then a few beyond that. So it's important to keep that context because uh, even EPA admitted in the notice that uh, any combination of those suggested changes could yield very different emission rate goals for, for the states. Uh, and I think um, without kind of contemplating a particular combination of, of components there, one thing that considering new gas or, or they also asked for, say, co-firing at existing coal, plant, coal plants, contemplating either of those as a component of B the BSER calculation would uh, add a bit of additional stringency in, in states that don't have a lot of current existing combined cycle units, but do have a lot of current existing coal units. Uh, so there is a handful of states that uh, building block two, the coal to gas switching, does not really apply at the moment. Um, and considering new gas or co-firing would allow that building block to apply to those states, meaning it would require some additional reductions from their current proposed emission rate goals. Uh, that would shift potentially the overall stringency that we consider in the report and also would potentially dis, uh, affect the distribution of impacts in our regional cooperation scenarios. But I couldn't, without giving a, con, you know, a concrete example, it's, it's hard, to, hard to say exactly how things would play out. But it, it, is, it is interesting to note that you know, it, would, it would also go, I mentioned earlier how they, they talk about doing RTO-wide or power market-wide uh, building block analysis, and that would also kind of including new gas, would also bring in the bounds of the, uh, the distribution of the emission rate goals. So you'd have less deviation and less differentiation across states, um, which uh, could be interesting. Anybody else want to? Um, I would just say in terms of, uh, I'd agree with, with John on, on those points, but also if, even if EPA were not to include the new natural gas combined cycles in the standard setting, but states were then to use the new combined cycles uh, and compliance mechanisms, it, it, it does impact a little bit in terms of the amount of gas that you may use to comply and that you may be complying, uh, 
using a new facility because it has a lower heat rate uh, and displacing maybe some of the existing gas facilities. Uh, so you'd see some distribution uh, dynamics there. I think we'd only have one more time for one more short question if there is one. If not, yeah, you want to do one? Short. You used fossil with CCS in your study. Does that include natural gas combined cycle with CCS? Uh, sh very short answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> slightly longer answer is almost all of the fossil CCS you saw on those charts was natural gas with CCS, not coal with CCS. Okay, well, listen, part of the reason we get people to come back is we let them leave on time. So um, I just want to express my deep appreciation to Rick and Erica and Kate for making time to be here today, my uh, deep appreciation to Trevor and John for the opportunity to work with them, and then Michelle and Whitney should stand up. Stand up. Yes. Sorry, we're the glory hogs, which you need some recognition. Both for their intellectual leadership and carrying a lot of weight on this. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks to all of you. Uh, again, we very much view this as our way of being helpful to a dialogue we think is ongoing. Uh, and we will be continuing this in, in, in ways that you can stay tuned for in the future. So thanks very much for coming today. <laughs>